Hello everybody and welcome to the Celtic Now and to our podcast. My name is Ryan Crawford. Also with me this week once again is Robert Boyle. Robert, how's things, mate? Good, Ryan. Thanks. Yourself? Yeah, not bad, mate. Obviously, again, another big interview. We're getting bigger, mate. We're getting bigger. Um, so, we're on an interview with a former agent, Robert. I think, my, I think this one will be a good one, mate. Oh, it'll be good, aye. It's an old school friend of mine um, and I'm just glad he came on and can share his stories with us and um, he's following Celtic, the good, the bad, the ugly, early years. Um, as you say, he's obviously known quite well way to school, um, but we'll get him introduced. William Glavin, how's things, mate? Not bad, Ryan, yourself, mate? Not bad, mate. I'm kind of glad you can know because me and Robert are kind of sick of talking to each other, so it's good to get some <laughs> some his opinion on, mate. Um, obviously, um, as Robert mentioned, a Celtic fan, you were a former agent. Yeah. Um, as we were talking before you came on there, that you're not doing at the moment. Um, how's yeah. obviously, how have you been following your life since you've kind of left and obviously due to lockdown and COVID, how's life been for you? Yeah, life's been a bit crazy, I think, for everyone. Um, with COVID, sort of last year, obviously, when I'd gone out of lockdown and I think everyone was the same. You know, you had the first two weeks of lockdown, everyone's enjoying it, you know, having a few beers in the garden, the weather was good, loving life, but... Um, it sort of grated us down a wee bit, didn't it, when you're sort of stuck at home all the time and life's a bit crazy at the minute. So it's pretty much been what everybody else has been up to, you know, try to keep yourself busy. Um, I've got two young kids to look after and stuff like that now with my wife, so they're definitely keeping us on their toes at the minute. So, uh, yeah, it's been quite busy, obviously, with them and stuff, but um, hopefully um, things are looking a bit more positive for this vaccine so our life can go back to a bit more normality. I think that's definitely something, talking about normality, I think it's something we're all craving now, Robert, especially getting to end the season, obviously the way Celtic's been performing, we've probably got the games, I kind of, what we've touched on there, it's definitely something we need to try and hopefully, obviously with the Euros coming up, hopefully get fans in, and hopefully we can all go ourselves, um, but hopefully we can get fans in and kick on next season. Definitely, Ryan, I just would like to get back to I think everybody would like to get back to some sort of wee normality to just go and meet your friends, family. I came a football wife rather than watching TV. Um, and just getting into the swing of things, uh, being back to a normal life and being able to go on holiday as a family and stuff like that. Um, we've all had holidays cancelled. Hopefully the vaccine rollout is obviously stepping up every day. They reckon they're getting more and more people vaccinated, which is good. And just to really get into some sort of normality again and getting back to watching football live and venting your frustration at the game rather than in your house and falling out with your missus and your kids. Aye, I think I think William would agree because I can see these faces probably like, aye, I might be back to the football. <laughs> Yeah, well, definitely. I think um, I think everybody tends to shout at the telly just now watching Celtic play at the minute. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, like, as Robert says, everyone wants to get back to the stadium, you know, the atmosphere of the stadiums and things like that. It's something that I do miss coming out of the agency world, but obviously I'm sure everybody does miss, you know, guys that are going following Celtic all over the place. So um, hopefully, hopefully next season we'll, we'll be back, um, back in the grounds and watching live football again, like Robert says. And obviously, the news this, uh, sorry, the news this week, the news has been breaking for a while, um, announced today, Robert, with Scott Brown leaving. Um, obviously, it's not really a bit of shock, considering they kind of thought it was going to happen, but we didn't know, we didn't know if it was going to happen, because you're like, no, it can't happen, we can't leave as a new, we've got a rebuild, we don't know who's going to be the manager. But obviously, your opinion on that, Robert, what's your feelings after like, getting announced today? Um, a wee bit, no wee bit, quite a big bit gutted. Um, but as they say, all good things have to come to an end. And the fairy tale thing is, he stayed in our season, played his bit part, got in the coaching role. Aye, but the guys gave us absolutely everything and more. He's been beyond our wildest dreams of how good a player he's been. You think at 4.4 million was a lot of money? For 13 years at 4.4 million, it's an absolute steal, as far as I'm concerned. Um, he's been. Everything that we could have asked for in a captain, a player, a, ma- a leader, um, on and off the park. I just wish the guy all well. Um, I'll be a lot gutted. Um, no seeing Scott Brown running about mad with a shaved head and a number eight jersey, but it gives somebody else an opportunity, whether it be a new player coming in into the role 
or some players round about him to then step up and be the leader on the park. But it's going to be weird seeing him in an Aberdeen shirt or even standing on the touchline. Um, I just hope, um, wish the guy all the well in the future because, as I said, he's been beyond my wildest dreams of how good a player, leader, teammate to players and to the support. I think as well, he's been really, really good. I got the pleasure of meeting him one time. I'll tell you a wee funny story about it. I met the full Celtic team in Tenerife um, two years ago, I think it was. We just beat Rangers 5-1 at Celtic Park. So anyway, I, I bump into the full Celtic team and Harry's bar in Tenerife. They were watching the Roma and Liverpool semi-final. So I bump in and I'm like a kid in a sweetie shop or a kid at Christmas. I'm practically fucking climbing all over them at the table and talking to them and Brownie's had a few drinks, should we say, and uh, I was like, trying to speak to him, but it was a wee bit hectic, so as I went to the toilet, he came out of the toilet, and I started speaking to him, and I was like to my missus, take a photo, take a photo, and she's like, all right, right, take a photo, and go to a photo with him, and he says, um, she says to him, don't think that's going up on the mantelpiece in the living room, he says, if you've got a, a large fire, put that up, and it'll keep the kids away from the the fire. <laughs> he spoke to him. So he was, he was genuinely nice. good laugh and stuff. Oh, yeah. um, it was nice that time. But I just as a, a person and how he's led Celtic to success is I don't know what else to say. The guy is a legend, and I don't use that word that phrase very lightly nowadays. I think he is an actual loving legend. No, definitely, mate. I think. Um... Maybe in our five, ten years, some fans will maybe then will really appreciate the job he's done at Celtic. Um, me personally, I'll get one of my thoughts on Scott Brown, but mm-hmm. me personally, um, I would say he's maybe irreplaceable in some capacity. Um, you, don't wear, you don't get a lot of players of that stats or that character, and as well as that ability to play Scott, because as people might, obviously Rangers fans are going to say he's this and that, or, in fact, most fans of Scotland don't really like Scott Brown. They don't like him because they want him in his team. That's my view. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he binds the Celtic on and off the park. It's just, obviously, we don't know the full engine out, so what he does bind the scenes because but to be a captain for so long, he must do something right because you don't be a captain set for so long if you don't do something right. So he's been very, as he says, Robert, everything he's gave everything to the shot. Um, he's basically... He's probably our best at Celtic fan now. He's 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 one of us. Um, he's going to be kind of lauded for years to come. Um, on, and I don't think he gets the credit he deserves. William for being a I think he's a I think he's a top quality player. Yeah. I think he, he always has been. It took my while to kick into Celtic, maybe his first year or two. Yeah. But since then he's he's no move to the for that middle of the park. And oh, I know he's gradually get back, but. You seen him under Brendan Rodgers, how he got totally rejuvenated, and he was for me. It's as Robert says, William. It's going to be hard no seeing that captain's armband in Scotland yeah. leading you before a Rangers game. Gone, that's going to attack this game. Yeah, uh, and I totally agree. And the funny thing is, I remember when Scott Brown signed for Celtic under Gordon Strang. I was actually probably his biggest critic in that first year. Um, and, and by God, the guy played, played, totally proved me wrong completely. Um, he's became Mr Celtic to me um, over the years the amount of trophies the guy won is incredible over the last 14 years I think he spent there at Celtic um, as you said it's going to be very very strange not to see him on the park playing it's going to be really really strange as Robert says seeing him on the touchline at Aberdeen or, or on the park for Aberdeen but um, you can't take away the sort of legend status that guy's built over the years so wish him all the very best on his new new chapter Because I think it's, it's going to be a very good um, maybe a learning curve for some of our team players because he's got one mentality he's played at the yeah. highest level he's played in Champions League he's played for Scotland captain Scotland so I think maybe for our team players if it is obviously you know because he's got Aberdeen now you've seen social media there all but people are saying that the Felix has got to sell it and all that it's just hearsay but yeah. I think maybe guys like your McCrory's Ferguson's and whoever else they might be wise to stay for another year and actually learn that from because mm-hmm. the experience and pedigree that he's got about Aberdeen's going to be very vital, I think, in them going forward. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I actually think Scott Brown influences the game on the park um, and he influences the game off the park as well. I think he's a big presence in the dressing room. 
I do know through people I've spoken to and players I've spoken to over the years that you know when new players tend to sign in at Celtic, it tends to get all the players together. It's a team mentality um, at, at Parkhead, and they would they would do a lot of things as a team off the park as well. You know, they sort of gel, and I think you saw that sort of spirit between all the players there. But Scott Brown was was key to that at Celtic, and as you said, I think some of the young players will learn a few things from him um, when he goes up to Aberdeen. I'm sure these guys like McCrory and Ferguson will learn a lot from him and um, spending just even a year with him going forward. So, yeah, he's going to be a big miss for Celtic, but I think it is probably the right time for him to go and, and maybe experience something different um, and a new challenge in his career. And as you say, to give somebody an opportunity to come in and try and step up. You know, we need to find a new captain now. Obviously, Cal McGregor's well done mm-hmm. a few times this year, so it could be him or it could be someone else that's pushing for it. So, yeah, we wish him all the best going forward. Right. Yes, mate. Hi, do you want me to go then? Ask Wally a question. Hi, fire, mate. Hi, fire, mate. Fire, mate. Hi, Wally. Um, on you go. How did you get in about the being an agent? First... Um, yeah, so basically growing up, I was football daft growing up, Robert. Um, mad at football when I was younger and I wasn't good enough to ever get to that level. I realised that quite quickly. So, um, but I was always interested in the sort of business side of, of football and business in general, actually, when I left school, I, I was really interested in that. So I'd always wanted to do it probably since I left school, but I've obviously been pretty young at the time. Um, and part of the regulations to be in at the time, you needed like a bond. You had to put down with the bank. It was like 100, 100 grand at the time. So I wasn't going to cough up 100 grand from anywhere quite quickly. So I sort of left it for a while. Um, but then the, re- the regulation changed. And FIFA basically brought out a, it was an exam you had to take. You took the exam at Hamden. And it was all sorts of questions that you had to study on, basically all the rules and regulations regarding transfers of players, contracts and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I went along and studied for it, passed it, and then it was kind of like, right, that's me, I'm great, that's me, an agent, but where do I go now, you know? And it was kind of sort of trying to find my feet, and I used to have a speak to some people that I knew at the time, and they were trying to give me a bit of advice, and um, other agents and things like that would sort of help me out. So that was pretty much how I got started. Um, doing, in, in the agency game itself. Did you have any somebody that influenced like, you, like took you under the wing and kind of a... I, I did. Um, there was a guy called Phil McTaggart um, who's actually John Viola's nephew and I got really close with him. Um, it was through a friend of a friend that knew Phil um, and me Phil got really pally and he was great. He, he taught me a lot about the business. He used to go into his house at night and he would explain things and you know, this player and that player and Phil would always... One of these guys, as long as always on the phone, you know, trying to cut deals and do deals and whatever. Um, and I used to be, I used to be, I used to like enjoy the bit of, you know, trying to find players, you know, is that player good enough? Is this doing a bit of scouting? I used to enjoy that side of it. So I used to go to fill with some players and you go, right, let me we'll try and move them here and we'll try and do this and that. And we never ever really got anything done, but see, just talking to him and learning from him and stuff like that, he was great for the first few years, um, just learning about the business. Great. Do you see, like, you're mentioning, like, the scouting part of it. Is that actually, yeah. does that come into agency at all? Or do you actually, oh, 100%. is it actually? I, I, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think to be a good, in my, this is just my opinion, I think to be a good agent, you've got to be a good scout. You've got to spot talent, potential talent. Um, because really, if you think about it, you want to take that player at whatever club he's at and take him to the next level, or take him to the next two levels, or whatever. So you've got to find players on that trajectory, and um, players that can do it. But it's one thing seeing them doing it in the park. It's not until you get to know that player and find out the sort of psychological aspect of it, if they can get to that level. Because the difference between really good players and the elite players is, in my opinion, psychology. Um, so, yeah, scouting does come in here. I really enjoyed that side of it, Ryan. That was one of the, the, the main parts I really enjoyed, was going to games, spotting players, taking notes. This guy, I fancy him. This guy's really good. He looks as if he can go to the next level. Um, so that's a major, major part of it, yeah. Here at Oxford... Doing the scouting, was there, see in general, was there any player that you've seen and thought, wow, he's going to be an absolute best? Um, there's probably been a few, actually, thinking about it. Kieran Tierney was one. I saw Kieran Tierney when he was about, he must have been about 16 at the time, playing down at Tory Lane for Celtic, and he just knew he was head and shoulders above everybody. Um, another player I saw who was really young at the time was Karen Oko Dembele, down at, and I was at Tory Glen, and Somebody told me about him, and, he, and I'm like, what does I'm like, what does it look like? And he's like, just watch for the the smallest guy on the park who's smiling, and he's beating running rings around everybody. So I went down to Tory Glen, and I'm looking about, and I could just see this wee guy in the park. And honest to God, it was running rings around everybody. He must have scored about eight goals in this game. 
and he just played this moment. It reminded me of Ronaldinho. Remember when Ronaldinho used to play? We always played with like a smile. Yeah. That's what it reminded me of. And I went, I'll never forget that boy's name. And obviously he's he's came up the ranks at Celtic. He's not quite done, but I thought he would have done by this stage. But whether he's had a chance or not, it's probably an argument to have. But he, him and I would probably say he was the one that I was like, wow, he's going to be a superstar. Um, and be like, listen, there's still time. He's still young at this stage. You know, there's still time for him to do it. But um, yeah, he's probably been the standout one, I would say. That's that's uh, quite, that's, that's uh, quite interesting. Um, because obviously we don't know Ring and Utsa. As you say, there's a chance. There's another chance. But yeah. as you say, you've seen him play at basically a public park now. Eh, yeah. Glenn. Yeah. But yeah. us as fans, we just see him playing the youth. And ah, he's playing no bad. But like yourself, you'll actually see him first hand. And yeah. obviously you're saying that for that early age. It proves that maybe his ability is really there. And maybe in general, maybe if he go, does go away for Celtic, he may be able to express himself. Yeah, he could do. Um, as I said, there's so many factors that are involved in it, especially with a player that young as well. You know, players are still developing physically as well as mentally at that stage. So, you know, there could be, he could be outstanding, but by the time he gets to 18, everyone else is caught up in him. But I don't think, I generally don't think that's the case with him, Bailey. I actually think there's actually a player in him. And I've actually been a wee bit, as a Celtic fan, a little bit disappointed he's maybe not had another chance of maybe playing in the first team. Especially now, because I think the Celtic team has really lacked a bit of width in the team this year. And I think that he could have gave us that bit of width. Forrest, for me, has been a big miss this year. But I think somebody young like Dembele could have came in and he could have helped us. I'm not saying he would have changed massively. But I think he could have came in and helped us. And to be honest, the more games these guys are playing, the better they get. So that would have helped us going forward as well. How was dealing with your first ever client, William? How was what, sorry? How was dealing with your first ever client? My first ever client? Who was it? Oh, my first ever client was a lad who was from Jersey. My good mate, Mark Toner, lives in Jersey. And he put me on to this player over there who played for the island. And he said to me, look, this boy's good. He was at Southampton in the academy and blah, blah, blah. So I said, look, I'd only really started out at that time. And I says, I'll, I'll speak to Airdrie about a few players at the time. So I said, I'll bring him up. I'll get him up to Airdrie. Um, so I brought him up, played the trial. It was outstanding. I think he's got a hat-trick in his trial. Um, got him to move to Airdrie. Um, but it, it just didn't quite work out for him there. I, I don't know if he was fully committed to it. Um, I think that he would maybe go back and look and say, did I give him my all? But the boy had talent, you know, the boy was good. But I think as well, I think players from England, especially come up to Scotland and don't realise how physical the game is up here. And, and I think he kind of struggled a wee bit from that side of it. But he was, yeah, he was the first first guy I've ever signed a contract with and got him a deal um, many years ago now when you think about, <laughs> think about it now, yeah. You see, obviously, obviously he says as well, before you come on with he says, obviously, when you were in, the, in that business, your phone's yeah. always busy, like, uh-huh. your phone's always on. How was like, a, How would you say like, a, your life as a, an agent really was? Was it always busy, hectic? What was your schedule dealing with um, transfers? And... Yeah, it, it was generally, you were always trying to find new clients. You were always speaking to players. You were always going to games. You were trying to find out who's this player, who's that player. You were speaking to your own clients to find out, you know, who's got an agent, who's not got an agent who's interested in talking to us. Um, transfer windows were the busiest periods of the year. They became really, really hectic because um, you were always lining up deals to get done, obviously, in those windows. January was always a disappointment. I don't, I don't think I've ever done a deal in January. In fact, I lie, I've done one for Ross County in January a few years back. Um, it was a loan deal last minute. But the majority of the deals I've done were always in the summer. But yeah, in general, you were... You were, you were just constantly switched on to the game. You constantly switched on to players, your own players. You'd speak to them every week about how they played in their games and you'd go and see them and stuff like that. So it was quite a hectic sort of time. But yeah, generally your phone was stuck to you with like glue because um, it was always going or you were always texting people or phoning people, etc. Because I think as well, <laughs> we're living a busy lifestyle. It's mm-hmm. like that. Did you ever get a break at all? Obviously, yeah. obviously football players get breaks. But yeah, of course. Is that what Obviously, but during that time, you maybe try to get deals for the new season and stuff. Yeah. Um, but do you have a time to kind of wind down and obviously a lot of football players play golf? Are you into golf yourself? Aye, I, 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 I try and play normally badly, to be honest. But um, uh, I, we always tend to go on holiday after the window closed. Um, you would always do that and you get a few weeks wind down because generally that was the quietest period. Deals are done. 
players are happy, season's kicking on, you tend to get a couple of weeks break and, and go on, and then things sort of build up towards either the summer window or the, the January transfer window. But yeah, you tend to go away on holiday and stuff like that to get away from it all and spend time with your family and things like that as well. You see, oh, I don't know, Robert, if you've watched the Sunderland documentary on Netflix, have you watched it? Yeah. I thought it was really, really good. Um, because obviously, William, you know yourself, like I, I actually like that when it shows you like the last minute deals and stuff like that. Is that the way it yeah. is, or it yeah, it? yeah, it is. It's funny you mentioned something the documented. One of the guys I worked with was in that. Um, don't know if you remember the bit. It was who was the guy? Martin Bain um, was there at the time, and he's trying to sign Chris Martin uh, and Alex, who I worked with at the time, was on the phone saying, "Oh well." He thought he was coming up for a medical, but apparently he wasn't coming up for a medical. Yeah, it was as hectic as that because hour by hour leading up to deadline day, things change so dramatically. At one minute you're going somewhere, next minute you're not, next minute it's back on, it's back off, it's back. It was like that constantly. Um, every summer window, I was saying to myself, oh, I'll, get, I'll get five or six or seven deals done here, and sometimes only that one, you know, because it just sort of falls by the wayside because there's so many factors involved in a deal, a transfer deal, and as well, clubs are. You know, signing players to replace other players who are moving, and if that player doesn't go, it's a bit like a domino effect um, during the sort of transfer windows. But yeah, the Sunday document captured that pretty well, I would say. That's great, William. You're saying yeah. there when you transfer, so you get a phone say from just say Sunderland. How does yeah. it all? But what? How does? How do you get about it? Well, basically, Robert, it, it tends to happen that you've normally generated that interest. So, say maybe six months prior to the window. I'm on the phone to something saying, you need to come and look at this player here. That's the guy you're looking for. And they would go, right, we'll send scouts out. And all that happens. And you're, you're in constant dialogue. And it's sort of it's like you're almost trying to gain momentum to keep things going. And the momentum builds up and builds up to the window. And then that's when you've got to strike with iron sword and try and get the deal done. That, that sort of happened when, obviously, I used to look after Ryan Christie and took him to Celtic from Inverness. That, that was the sort of thing that happened there was Ryan had broke through really quickly. Um, he'd had an offer to go to England very early on but he'd said look no I want to stay in Inverness stay at home with his parents and I want to play football every week blah 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 it's fine no problem um, and then Celtic were showing a bit of interest and it was a little bit of interest but then it was a bigger bit of interest and then it's like no really want and it kind of built up and it got to the point that clubs are talking they're trying to negotiate the fees we are talking about personal, de- uh, personal terms and stuff like that but it, it went from like July to the last day of the window and it eventually get done on deadline day so that's how long it can actually take to get the deal from start to finish um, so we managed to get Ryan's deal done on deadline day which was brilliant for everybody Ryan being a Celtic fan me being a Celtic fan that I even made it even better you know so um, so yeah that, that's how the sort of process was it does take a long time Is that it's Peter Lawwell being very nitty gritty or uh, a couple uh, let's just say Lawwell I'm just meaning is no. any German of any club is that how it becomes so long? It, it, I would say yeah, it's definitely due to personalities, and I would definitely say that it probably was so long because Peter's quite a shrewd guy. Um, but Peter was shrewd for a good reason because he was trying to look after Celtic. Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day, he's Mister Celtic when we're negotiating with him and trying, you're trying to get the best deal for our client. Um, but yeah, it definitely comes down to personalities. It also comes down to how badly that they want the player, but. Dealing with Peter, he does not try not to show that as his hand, you know, he's trying to keep you on your toes. So that, that's just the way negotiations work at the end of the day. And um, the key thing was we, we managed to get the deal done and everybody was happy after it. So that that, that's, it's interesting that um you're saying that like, how like see like when Ryan says that he doesn't want to go to another team. Yeah. Do you use an agent? Do you go, no, I'll try and get a better deal somewhere else, or do you just listen to the player? How does it all work? Um, to be honest, we would tend to give the player our opinion of the situation. However, with, 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 if you take Ryan's case, Ryan was pretty young at the time when this English club had come in for him. Um, and he didn't feel it was the right move for him, so we didn't press it. Some agents out there would press it mm-hmm. and would try and convince them to do it. I was never that type because I felt as if if you pressed it hard enough and he'd done it and then didn't like it, then it would backfire the other way. Do you know what I mean? So at the end of the day... The, the way we used to speak to players was, look, we'll give you the options. It's up to you to take the options. You know, it's up to you to walk through the door. Mm-hmm. So we do, I've done that with every single client that I looked after. Um, we tried to give them as many options on the table as possible. End of the day, it was down to them what they wanted to pick. If I felt they were making the wrong decision, I would definitely tell them. Um, obviously, the Celtic one was an easy one to sell to Ryan, you know, saying, look, we're doing it, <laughs> type thing. And he was all for it. So 
Um, but with other players, you know, they may be not keen on it. They'll maybe ask you, they'll maybe say, what do you think? You know, and you give them your opinion. But at the end of the day, it's up to them. It's their decision, you know, it's their career. No, because I, I find it, I just find it interesting how, like you say, it, and maybe deals go from maybe like September to December to yeah. July to the end of the window. It's just, because that's what I've said, is I've been a big thing, like, because obviously I don't know and it's a transfer and how it works, but maybe me as a fan, as we spoke about before we come on with Robert as well, that me and Robert have spoke about it can I, for a while now that we've had all these months in lockdown to get wingers and centre backs, and then we've had a January yeah. to get a winger. Why did it take? How obviously I don't know the engine notes, but if surely if like the Celtic and Nicky Hammond, surely if Nicky Hammond goes right, he's decent, he's healed days, right? Neil, sign him up, say to Peter, say to whoever it deals with, get the deal done. Why, yeah. what as you say, is there some pain stumbling blocks with personal terms, transfer fees? Is that why it lasts so long? Yeah, I think, I think that that can be. A, I think I'm not saying this happens at Celtic, but I think at some clubs as well. The scout might think something. The manager might think, no, I don't fancy him. The chief executive might, I don't want him, I want him. And everyone's not on the same page. I think you find that where clubs do business early, early in the window, all of them, there's like a synergy between all the all the main guys, the main players there. They're all working together as a team. I think you tend to see that more with clubs of the sporting directors because they tend to go, that's my decision. Coach agrees with me, end of story. But I think maybe other clubs at Celtic, you know, I think we all know Peter had a lot of influence over the transfer dealings. Um, Neil might have put his opinion in at the time. You know, Nicky Hammond's got his opinion on the situation, so they're, they're not all connecting. And that would be quite frustrating because at one minute you think a club's interested in your player, next minute it's like, no, he's not interested in a player. And that actually happened. That happened to me um, a few years ago being about to Czech Republic, and I think it was the Under-21 European Championships. And we get wind of a player we were trying to take from Sweden and bring him over to the UK, and we heard that Norwich City were interested in him. So... We were speaking to the director of football at the time and, and he says, look, definitely interested, want to do it. The manager's out there uh, for, in the Czech Republic for the, the Euros, doing his pro licence at the time. and They were doing the pro licence out there. Go out and speak to him and we'll get this deal done. And we turned up and we met the manager and sat down and he went, no, I don't like that player. And we are sitting going, I can't believe this. We've come all the way out to Prague thinking this deal's going to get done. We've rung the player's agent out and the manager goes, Nah, I'm not interested. He's not for me. Nah, he's not for me. So it, it just showed you that different personalities at the clubs would clash and not agree on things, and it made it, it made it really frustrating for us as well. But yeah, that does happen from time to time. Do you think that? See you on that, William. See you on yeah. that, Dean. So users spent all that money going out to Prague and that will the yeah. club, or do you need to cover that on your own? Like we, your co- own? we we covered that ourselves. We covered that. It was it was one of those ones. It, it's almost like a calculated risk because nothing was set in stone. But at the time, we felt that this is a deal to be done here. You know, the the guy was a good player. I think, ironically, the guy did go to England. He just didn't go to that club, um, and we weren't involved in that. But um, it was frustrating at the time, Robert. Hundred percent. You're out there spending money trying to get a deal done, and all of a sudden, manager just sits down in front of you point blank, and just says, "Nah, no for me." So we like kind of like wasted journey, but. Um, don't get me wrong, we managed to meet some other people out there. We made the trip worthwhile. A lot of the managers and coaches were out there because of the pro licence. They were all doing it around about the Euros. So we managed to meet a lot of people which which made it worthwhile in the end up. But obviously we never get the deal done, which was frustrating at the time. He's, he's always involved with, not involved, he's always in communication with managers and saying, listen, um, this guy's decent and stuff. He's... I, I, to be honest, there was a few managers I spoke to used to keep in touch with over the years. Um, scouts, you tend to speak to more. They're normally your first go-to guy, you know, because they'll tell you, you know, I'm looking for a right back, a centre back, whatever, and they would, and then you would try and connect the dots. You go about this player, that player, and throw a few names in the in the into the hat, you know. So there was a guy you sort of built a relationship with. Don't get me wrong, you, you get you get to know managers um, as well, speaking to them. You get to know some of the chief executives, some of the sporting directors as well, just through dealings from them. Um, but yeah, I would say most of the guys I built really good relationships with was probably the scouting team guys, and they were all good guys, just. Genuine guys like us, you know, going out and enjoying watching football when that was their job, you know, and they loved it. To see you, you're, is there any, see how you're, you've built up a reputation and Ryan Christie's was one of your clients. Uh, yeah. Then he has friends then approach you and say, hi, well, your man, Ryan's friend, and I heard you've done really good things for Ryan. Would you yeah. like to? 
Yeah, I did, I did get that um, through one of Ryan's friends at the time, a young boy called Callum Ferguson, who was in sort of, he was coming through behind Ryan. In fact, I think they might have been the same year, but Ryan sort of broke through really quickly. Um, but Callum was a great guy. Um, didn't quite get to the level that he wanted, but he actually went abroad and played, went to Canada and things like that. I still keep in touch with Callum to this day. Um, always texts us and sees how the family's doing. We keep in touch. and um, He was a really, really nice, nice lad. Really nice lad to keep in touch with. Good stuff. To see as well, um, obviously you're talking about how the deals happen and stuff, see, when it comes yeah. to the actual deals. Are you employed by the club or the player or the agency or do you just kind of take it upon yourself to say to a player, listen, this club might be interested in you and stuff like that? Um, generally what happens, Ryan, you, you, you tend to have the player signed to you as part, as part of your contract, the representation contract it's called. And um, your main focus is that player. So, like I said, you'll be speaking to clubs to either try and get them a move or try and get them a new deal at a club. Um, what does happen, though, it generally happens at the elite level. So, you know, top premiership level, top European level. Agents will tend to broker deals between clubs. Now, some of the best guys do it. It's Jorge Mendes will tend to do that. And what he'll do is he'll he'll bring two clubs together. But he'll also bring the player's agent into the deal and get the deal done. And then they'll split it between them all type thing. And that's generally what happens with the big deals. So your Mino Rayolas and your Torgi Mendes, that's how they do business day on, day out. Because they've got so much influence over the clubs because they've got so good players in their stables, you know. Um, but myself, I never ever got to that, that level. So uh, it was generally always the player. You would go and speak to the club on behalf of the player. So obviously oh. I mentioned the two guys, the two, yeah. the two guys, they, they're mainly the guys you always hear about. Um, yeah. Obviously they're dealing with superstars, as he says. So yeah. is that... How do I say it? Would that, is, is that harder work for them dealing with the superstars than it would be yourself dealing with maybe those um, elite players? Or is that harder? I no, I, would, I, I don't know personally, but I would imagine it's probably harder. I'd imagine that's 24-7 with those type of players because, see, the thing is about these guys and, and guys round about them as well, there's other agents always try to get your players because they can see the value in them in terms of what they can get off them from a commission point of view. So, there must be tons of agents going for the players that they've got. And they've got they've always got to be on their toes, you know, making sure they're looking after that player um, and they're their number one client, you know. Um, as I said, you know, guys like Hoggy Mendes and Miller have got a massive stable of players and they're at that level for a reason. So they're obviously good at what they do. Um, but yeah, I think it would I think it would be a 24-7 job that. But don't get me wrong, don't, these guys have probably got a lot of people that work for them that do a lot of the day-to-day stuff as well. So to obviously manage it more like a, like a business itself. See, see, William, on your players that you had, who was the youngest one that you had on your books? And the youngest the, one? Just try to think who we had young ones on the books. I didn't have many youth players at the time. To be honest, most of the players that we had was probably sort of reserve level, you know, just sort of breaking through. Because yeah. what tends to happen is, see, when you're a lot of the top, top young players, you know, like your Karamoka Dembele's or um, some of the lads that have let, I can't remember the boy's name, is went to Bayern Munich from Celtic, those guys, you know. Person. Who, sorry? <laughs> yeah, I think, aye, that's him, yeah. So these, these lads, these young lads have got a lot of potential, but you need to put a lot of work into these players to get a return from it. So the way I looked at it was, I was always trying to work in the first team area of players, of reserve team area of players. And then when I was sort of, when you built up a little stable of players, then you could look for some of the younger ones and try and target some of them. So I didn't really have many young players. Um, it was mostly sort of just at the reserve level. Um, yeah. See when you mentioned um, like guys are playing the reserves and stuff, do you personally, or does, do you have a word in the to try and get a loan? to try and get a better move and loan to get game time, or is that done to the player? No, um, generally the club would always look at it as a, a way to develop the players, to let them go out and get some first-team experience. Um, they would generally, if you, if it was safe, if it was Celtic, you went to Chris McCartan and said, Chris, look, can this, we want this player to go out and loan, he would go 100%, let's do it. I think there wasn't, there wasn't many occasions I had to get involved in that. Generally the clubs would just take care of themselves and they, and they would go to like, you know, some of these young Celtic players would maybe go to Clyde or Albion Rovers or something like that, or even Morton. A lot of players would go over there because of the connections the clubs had um, in terms of young players coming through. But yeah, 
the, the big clubs would generally see that as a good way on the sort of player pathway to get first team experience. There's obviously you said as well um, about the guy Callum. Is it Callum you're talking about? Her? The behind Ryan? Callum? Yes, yes, um, that's right. Yep. He says that he's obviously about to Canada and stuff. He's mm-hmm. involved in a lot of deals. Obviously, he mentioned the, the, the prag deal as well, it didn't work out, but mm-hmm. but you always a lot, uh, but you always abroad a lot, can then yep. travel about dealing with can I deals, loan deals abroad. Yeah, um, yeah, you, you tend to go abroad. As I said, I went to the Euros under 21 Euros at the time, and we were out there meeting people, players, managers, etc. Other agents would go out there, so it was always a good way to network with, with other uh, agents and managers, etc. But then sometimes I've went to try and do deals abroad. You try and meet other players' agents from abroad and you basically try and bring them, say it's a player from Portugal and bring him from Portugal over to England and try and do that deal together. So there was a lot of that that happened um, at the time as well. And a lot of it didn't come off the way you wanted it to come off, but sometimes it can just be down to timing at the end of the day. You know, something, as I said, that, that player who is the Swedish lad end up going and signing for Nottingham Forest like a year later, you know. So maybe if it was a year down the line, it might have been as it done that, but at that time it just didn't quite work out. So, is how was obviously says you've been abroad and stuff. How mm-hmm. obviously a football players they're abroad a lot. Was that is it the same kind of lifestyle? You're always travelling on planes, having to see me do that. Is yeah, is like football players is accommodation or pay for stuff as well. Is in terms of a player went out there, is yeah. That what you mean? Sorry, yeah, it, it tend to be if a player went out there, they were looked after by the club, and that would be stipulated on my contract. So, um, for instance, you remember Ryan Gold saying for Sport in Lisbon a few years back, and, and he was well, he would have been well looked after by them, put in accommodation, got to learn the language. One of my players is actually like, was a good, is a good friend of Ryan, um, both of them played at Dundee United together, and you know, young Ryan speaks fluent Portuguese portuguese now and enjoys his lifestyle out there i think i heard actually it was a, an interview with him recently on another podcast he was talking about it and loving life in portugal and um, out there so yeah we, we would expect the players who were going abroad would always be looked after by the club um, and generally the bigger clubs sort of have like a player liaison officer even in england they've got that as well for a lot of the foreign boys that came over and at celtic and they would look after the player and just help them settle, you know, find a house, car, get them settled, bank accounts and all that sort of stuff. General day-to-day stuff so that they could take their focus and, and obviously use, do it on the park and not be distracted off the park. You see, you're saying, William, yeah. like the Euros and that, do you, what being, say, the Euro Under-21 Championships is coming up, do you and say some of your other guys you work alongside, do you get sent out there for two weeks at a time to... Try and identify a few players for you. Yeah, we, we, we did. We, we used to do a lot of scouting through, there's a media platform called Scout. a lot of the clubs use. So you, it's like video footage from every game of players. But the main reason you would go out to the Euros is because you knew that all the agents are going to be there, all the scouts are going to be there. So it was a great way to just get face-to-face with people. Because we found that when you're trying to do business, when you get face-to-face with people, it tends to work out better than over the phone or texting and stuff like that. So... That was the main aim, was to get out there and network with people, because you just knew everyone was going to be at the Euros. How long were you for, like, two weeks of time and stuff? No, it wasn't as long as that. I think when we went to Prague, it was like three or four nights we spent there. Caught a couple of games, um, and we met quite a lot of people. You were just constantly meeting people all the time. Um, don't get me wrong, it was as much business as it was pleasure. Nice to get a few beers and that when we were over there as well with people, and that was always good. Um but yeah, that, those were definitely the good bits when you can go to places like that and meet these guys and meet people and talk business and talk football. It was always really good to do that. Do you, do you say, you know, our other agents say from England and yeah. maybe you're very connected to people in Scotland and maybe one of his clients is maybe wanting to move, move to Scotland. Yeah. Will they you and say, hi, William, wonder if you can come in and give me a wee hand with a deal? And Yeah, yeah, that would happen. Yeah, that, absolutely, because... The way that the agents sort of, most agents look at it is if, if you can get 50% or something, it's better than 100% of nothing in a deal. And, and if you can do something together and pull something off, then there's no reason why you can't work together and do it and achieve it. It's really good to know, because it's something I don't think a lot of would have known. You know what no. I mean? And the modern world does a lot of greed, whereas yeah. people are using their brains are saying, if I bring William in and the two is date together, at least we can get the deal done. Yeah. He can way to get me into the club to communicate with them easier. Yeah, I, I think, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of greed in the game. There's, I've seen it myself in the game and that person that 
you're doing the deal with, you, you've got to trust them. You tend to sign a contract between the two of you to make sure everything's legally binding and done and there's, no one's going to get messed about. There is a lot of guys out there who will try and take advantage of that situation. Um, but listen, you've just got to sort of choose your people carefully. And you tend to, what you tend to do is you tend to build relationships with people over the period of time and then maybe maybe a year or two years or three years down the line that you actually do that deal with that agent. But you've got to sort of build that relationship over time to achieve that. I think it's, it's interesting you say that. Like, um, obviously, there's a lot of greed, and not just in agency wise, and in football in general. Yeah. Um, as you say, in trust buffy, I'm guessing trust buffy is a big thing when dealing with deals and players, because obviously, see, I don't know how it works, but can players sign with you and then go to somebody else, or do they need to sign a uh, stay with a contract with you? Yeah. So you tend to what what it's called representation contract, and that's between you and the player. It was always a maximum of two years. Um, so every two years you have to renew that. So at the end of two years, the player or the agent can say, look, we'll move on, go elsewhere or whatever. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't stop people from trying to sign them at all. There's no deterrent whatsoever. There has been occasions um, that I've experienced that players have been signed to me and still went signed with that other agent. Um, so that makes things a bit muddy and, and sort of muddies the waters a wee bit. But at the end of the day, I would have been protected anyway should that agent have negotiated a contract and got a commission. But it doesn't stop people um, in this industry. There's a lot of people out there that will just go and sign as many players as they want, you know, and then hopefully they get two or three of them that are going to make it to the top level um, to obviously get their commission back. But that, that was never the way I operated. I always tried to operate and try to be a bit methodical and sort of pinpoint players that I felt would go on the trajectory up the way and go up to the next level. Um, just try and be there and be there to help them and be part of that. As you say, is that basically that kind of... And co- that's kind of making your scouting, as you say, that's kind of putting your scouting expertise to kind of yeah. use as well, your agent, but you know that this guy might do, obviously do yourself a turn, but do yourself a turn with going somewhere else and yeah. um, help you as well. Yeah, exactly. And I, I would say to anyone, if anyone's going to get involved in the agency world, and I would, I would never say that, um, I would never put anyone off doing it. It was great. It was definitely ups and downs, though. You know, for every high you had, you had every low. You need to be thick-skinned. You need to understand you're going to be rejected. Things aren't going to happen. You're going to waste a lot of time on certain things. But if anyone's out there that wants to do it, definitely look into getting the FA do a course. I think it's like a scouting ID course they do. Get doing that. Learn about scouting. Identifying talent. um, Because it definitely will help you in the long run. See you on... Probably when Brian Christie was with our players. Any other well known players that was on your books that nobody would know about? Um, so, the agency that I worked for at the time were called Sidekick Management. They're, they've been rebranded now to New Vision, New Vision Sports, I think they're called. Um, I still talk to the two guys who operate the business. They've actually became, we've all became good friends from working together. But at the time when I was there, Gary Hooper was a client. Um, Chris Martin was a client. Obviously, we had a few caps for Scotland. Um, I don't think anybody else that we had at the time. We had Micah Richards um, at the time as well. So, yeah, there was quite a few names we had on the books, mostly down in England. Um, and, and the sort of focus for me was to bring players from Scotland into the agency. Um, and that's how basically I got in. Yeah, that was basically my role within the agency at the time, was to basically try to cover Scotland. Have you any <laughs> stories on any of these players that you've dealt with? Like, stupid- um, Anything you've not just try to think as an agent, and in daft, I don't know if I, I make a few phone calls, but I tell a few stories and they'll be <laughs> saying to me what oh, you did. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't get Will's name in it, just no, no, I, 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 I
That's no Neil McCann. Neil McCann's no Irish. It was Neil Lennon. <laughs> Neil Lennon that had phone, and I hadn't even realised. <laughs> so, so I texted the boy back and I went, I asked for Neil McCann's number, no Neil Lennon's. He went, oh my God, I've just sent you Neil Lennon's number. <laughs> he must have been gone. I was like off the phone and gone, how can I know pinpoint what's wrong here? It was blatantly the Northern Ireland accent. <laughs> So that, that's probably one of my funniest ones that I had. That's good. Sorry. That's, that's quite funny, because especially, especially, I see it obviously in the, in the agency world, it might be quite serious and stuff like that happens. Quite, yeah. It's quite comical. <laughs> I, no, it definitely was. I, I was kicking myself after it, because I'm going, how can I not realise I'm talking to Neil Lennon on the phone? Do you know what I mean? I'm sitting going, who am I talking to on the phone here? But I knew it definitely wasn't Neil McCann. So, yeah, it was a funny one. It was a funny one. Was Louis Hibbs at the time? He really? was, uh, he was at Hibs, and he, was saying, he actually said to me, speak to Graham, and he was talking to Graham Maffey, who's like their, he's like the sporting director now, and I, and I used to speak to Graham quite regularly, actually, um, and when he when he said Graham, I came off the phone and I went, that's what made me tap, it wasn't even the fact that it was an Irish accent, it was the fact that he said Graham, I went, that's Neil Lennon, I've just spoke to you on the phone, <laughs> you must have been going like, ah, that's that guy all about, so anyway. Brilliant. You see, well, you're probably Gary Hooper, yeah. um, well, I... Me's a Celtic fan. I love Tupper. Um, I thought it was really, really. I thought he maybe when he left Celtic. I, I thought he maybe again. I don't know your opinion as an agent, but um, I thought he maybe could have stayed in our, in our season or two, and maybe say I thought from England yeah. to Celtic. But yeah. I can't criticise anybody in football for moving for more money or yeah. better prestige because in the day we all know that football is <coughs> not career. Um, but I, I love Tupper, and we see somebody like. Was he, was he very, very well kind of asked about before he went to Celtic? Was a lot of clubs want to sign him? Um, so I think when when Alex, who I worked with, got involved with him, there was another agent that took him to Celtic at the time. But Alex had knew him because I think they're from the same sort of part of London, like Essex way. Uh, and Alex had basically spoke to him and then he was looking to go back down to England at that time. So Alex got involved and then he got involved of taking him from Celtic down to Norwich City um, at that time. But Gary loved his time at Celtic. There's been a couple of cases over the years that he could have went back, um, but it just didn't quite work out. It's something that we were trying to do, um, I remember a few years back, actually. And it didn't quite work out at the time. Neil Lennon was always a big fan of him. Neil Lennon tried to get him at Bolton when he was there and just couldn't do it at the time. Um, but Gary's, uh, Gary loved Celtic. I know that. Um, he loved his time at Celtic. I think a lot of the players at that time loved their time there. You know, the Joe Ledleys of the world and people like that as well, Adam Matthews. So, um, But yeah, he, Obviously, Gary's went on to do well for himself. He's obviously out in India now playing. I um, always keep a close eye on him myself because, like you, Ryan, I was a big fan of him at the time. He was my favourite player at Celtic back then. Um, just the ultimate goal scorer for us, and he done really well. Done really well for the club. You see, obviously, you, you spoke about how he, he's, he's in India and stuff, and I, I thought, I just, I generally think he was brilliant, eh, William. I thought yeah. I've, about him, and I'm, I'm happy that in a way that he's that we've seen him. And obviously he says about mm-hmm. him maybe coming back. I know that there was rumours about in the summer there about him coming back. Was, that, was there anything in that summer there? I no, it I, I was actually a couple of years ago. Um, okay. I'm trying to think what year it would have been. I think Neil was there at the time. I think Neil had just came in um, and we were pushing it to try and make it happen. Gary wanted it to happen. I think you maybe seen he put a couple of tweets out and things like that or retweeted a couple of things to, with, with fans, etc. And but it wasn't meant to be at that time. Celtic were obviously looking at other options and things. And I think he ended up going out to Australia or New Zealand. I think it was Wellington he went and signed for after that. So, yeah, it, it didn't quite happen. But, yeah, when he was here, he was brilliant. He was an absolute great player. Credit to watch. That team was great to watch as well, if you remember. Um, yeah. or under Neil Lennon the first time. So, um, But, yeah, he's obviously out. He's still doing his business. He's still scoring goals. Even, albeit India, he's out doing it. But, yeah, he was, he was a class act on the part. See, working with some players, is any of them like very nice and they'll maybe like treat you and the family to maybe a wee break in that if they maybe if you clinch a deal and stuff for them? They... I never had that, mate. I never, I never, ever, yeah. Um, I got, I think I got on well with most of the most of the boys who looked after. Um, I was never treated to a, a trip to Monaco or anything like that. If that's what you're alluding to there, but um, no, I got on with most of them. Some of them I still keep in touch with as well. Um, send a wee message now and again, obviously saying that they're doing well, etc. So um, there wasn't any of them that I ever really had a problem with at all. They obviously made decisions to move on to another agency or go and do something different. That was that was always fine with me. That was their own. Would they bond? 
Did they go out maybe and take you for a golf day out or a meal or something? Um, I'm just trying to think. Well, sometimes you would meet up to go out for some tea or something like that, you know, catch up for a coffee and things like that as well. That happened quite a lot. Mm. Um, met a lot of players over the years making out for some tea and coffees and things like that. Um, never ever went on a trip away anywhere with any of them. Um, sometimes I think you sort of kept business to business as well, if you know what I mean. Um, most with most players, but I do know agents have close relationships with their players as well when they'll go on holidays and things like that together. But I suppose you just develop that relationship over time then. Yeah. That's I think obviously you say some agents do can I get a friendship? I think that's is that you know, maybe sometimes like you say you you still kind of watch some of the players you've dealt with and you still keep in contact. Do you mm-hmm. think that is vital because if you've not got a good relationship with the guy you're working with, not just about the deal in general. You, you may actually know that like, how do you how do you say may not may not kind of how do I say it? Like, you wouldn't really be a lot of like, talk between these. It might just be as you say, it's just working, and that's it. That's yeah, it. I think I, I think it's to be trustworthy. I think uh, yeah, trust is the number one thing. I think between you and a client, not even in football, maybe in any sort of business similar to this, you, you've you've got to trust each other hundred percent. I mean, you don't trust each other; it's never going to work. You've got to have. Um, that sort of synergy between the two of these. Um, to, to both of these need to be going down the same route as well. You know, you want to be achieving the same sort of thing. So sometimes though that can be difficult because some players that I've dealt with over the years think that they should be maybe going to the next level sooner than what they actually can. And sometimes you need to just sit down and have that conversation, almost like, look, I know you're doing, no, you're not going to like to hear this, but it's not going to happen. It'll maybe be the next window or, or maybe the window after that. But what we try to do with all of our clients was sort of put a plan in place, like a pathway. So we would say, like, we'll get you to this point, and then by year two, you'll be at this point, and by year three, you'll be at this point. And we would show them that and illustrate it to them so they see, so they saw it themselves and said, right, I'm going to buy into this 100%. Don't get me wrong, some players would just go, I'm not buying into this. I don't believe in it. But then you just know it's not going to work from that point on. Was there any clubs, William, that you had to deal with that you just thought, they're a nightmare to deal with and you just feel like you're not going to get anywhere with certain do you don't I, need to I don't, mind, I, I don't I don't mind naming them to be honest because I had a big major fall it was Inverness I had a fall at Inverness big time um, because when Ryan left um, there was a bit of a fall out there between the chairman at the time and myself and it, it actually affected I had another player at Inverness at the time and it actually affected me trying to do a deal for that player um, and Basically, things just sort of broken down to the point they didn't even want to talk to me. But at the end of the day, I was trying to do the best by the client at the time. So I was kind of like, well, if that's what it's going to take, then that's what it's going to take. And that was my attitude at the time to it. Maybe I would have done things a wee bit different because I'm a wee bit older and a bit wiser now. But at the time, I was all about just get the deal done. No matter what I'm going to say, just get the deal done. But yeah, that's probably one of the club that I had an eye And I never, ever done any other business with them again after that. So that's all. When you're talking about like you had uh, Mika Richards and stuff, is it is it totally different dealing with clubs in different countries? Do they all work different? Like England, yeah, it's more money and stuff, but yeah. is it harder to work in England and Scotland or is it easier to work um, abroad? And I think, I think England's probably a bit easier, I would say. There's more money in England, which tends to help. Trying to get a deal in Scotland can be difficult, especially if it's a player coming from England up to Scotland because. Even, even now, like, the, the gulf between wages is incredible. You know, I had a scenario once before that there was a goalkeeper that we had at Chelsea at the time, mm-hmm. and we were trying to bring him up to Scotland to go play in the Premier League in Scotland. And um, I'm not mentioning the player or the player's name or that, but we probably brought him up, and he was on something like, what was it, 10 grand a week he was on at Chelsea. He hadn't even played for the first team. He was on 10 grand a week. As soon as we spoke to the Premier League club, we like, um, this is what he's on, so how much can you contribute? And they'll just like, ah, forget it. There's, there's no way we can contribute anything towards that. So, but the, the, the ironic thing was that player would probably just sit in Chelsea reserves or sit on the bench week in, week out. Being a goalkeeper as well, there wouldn't be many opportunities because I think you had Pell check in front of him at that time. So the scenarios like that would make, it made life really difficult to do business in Scotland. But in England, it, it tended to be a lot easier because there was just generally more money around. When you go to abroad, Every culture seems to be a bit different. Some clubs you would speak to abroad one you to deal with a certain agent, so you had to go through him, so he got his bit of the his slice of the pie, so to speak. But some countries that's just the way they operate, that you just sort of need to buy into that, um, and that's how the deal was structured. Sure, really, really, 
happy you're saying that. Like we all know that England and the money, and I, I honestly reckon maybe in five years' time that other clubs, like the top two clubs in Scotland, will be looking at League Two, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe even the Conference, because I reckon the golf and money and stuff is just getting bigger, mm-hmm. bigger. Right. And yeah. I just, I just find football sometimes just makes me a wee bit sick. Um, mm-hmm. What I like about Scottish football is it's passionate fans, it's real football, whereas down there, as you say, William, i seen a thing, it was maybe only about three, four years ago, mm-hmm. a young kid at Chelsea had signed his first professional contract at 16, and mm-hmm. for his hard work, he went and bought his dad a top-of-the-range Mondeo or something. It wasn't a Mondeo, it was just a top-of-the-range car, and the boy was 16, and his dad had worked his full life but couldn't afford this car, but here's yeah. a... 16, who's just signed a professional contract with Chelsea, obviously mm. signing on fee, and he goes and buys his dad this, this it's car. Crazy, it? it's, it, it's actually shows you that when these, for me, these players that go into those sort of contracts, do they really have the desire, you know, to go to the next step, to go to the next level? I think one of the things that I think Celtic should really be doing now is tapping into the young talent up here and in England as well. I know at the minute we tend to be losing a lot of young players for some reason, but what, what you've got to do for a young players is create a pathway to the first team. And I think in England especially that doesn't happen. You look at some of the top players, young players from England who went, went abroad, you know, like Jaden Sancho has went over to Borussia Dortmund. Look at what he's doing now. Um, obviously didn't have the pathway at Man City. The young boy Jude Bellingham's went to Borussia Dortmund as well, even though he's been offered Man United and Man City here as well. So I think when young players are getting offered these crazy amounts of money on that, you sort of question whether they've got the desire and the hunger, you know, to get to that next level. Um, but I think I think that's something Celtic need to address as a club. I think they need to tap into the young players and give them a pathway, you know, like the likes of Dembele, you know, coming through. Um, even like young Ewan Henderson, who I'm actually a big, big fan of. I think Ewan Henderson's a great young talent and I think he should be given more game time to play. But hopefully going forward next season, Celtic will address that because I just don't think they've done that of late and I think they're losing young talent because of it. That's something, that's something we've been speaking about quite a bit uh, in the podcast, uh, William, yeah. about having a structure and we, we've been big on, obviously now it's meant to make that a lot now, but for mum has been well up and talk about we've got to have a structure, f- football's changing. I'm going to manage to speak about how when it's changing, how, how it affected your work, but in the Celtic, mm-hmm. I think the structure it's got to change, I think, because football's getting modernised and as much as obviously you dealt with guys like Chris McCart, John Park. We spoke yeah. about how Celtics recruitment was actually really decent when they were in John Park. And, mm-hmm. and now the model is kind of, it's not working now. We need to change it. And we've spoken about how they've got, have, they've got to have the same system and the same structure from, like, if it's 4-4-2 to the youths, 4-4-2 to yeah. the development squad, 4-4-2 yeah. at the first team, and the full pathway is going to be the same because, like we noticed when the... Dubai uh, thing happened when yeah. the youth players playing. As much as we're saying like Dembele, Okoflex, um, who's a great Harper, yeah. very, very, youth, uh, very, very good talents, but you've seen the big difference for the physical side and, yeah. and the tactical now of uh, the players. And I think, as you say, they've got to have a pathway knowing how to play for the first team to the youths and how basically to play the same way in the first yeah. team. I, I would agree. I've actually been banging on for a long time about probably just to me and some of my mates and my dad we always have a big conversation about it as well but banging on a long time about there's got to be like a sporting director director of football in place at clubs nowadays as you said football's been modernised now but I think Celtic need to bring in a structure like you said that that sporting director sets the tone and sets the philosophy about how the teams are going to play and what the pathways are and there was a guy in Germany who'd done it really well a guy called Ralph Ragnick who done it at Hoffenheim and then took that model from Hoffenheim and took it to Leipzig. Look how well Leipzig are doing now. Um, and obviously, we were linked with a guy called Jesse March um, a few weeks back there, who was the assistant manager at Leipzig with Ralph Ragnick. And they're of all a sort of similar mode, like Thomas Tuchel worked under him, Julian Nagelsmann, who's a Leipzig manager, worked under him as well. All these coaches come from the same philosophy. But if you've got someone as a key guy like Ralph Ragnick in your club, he can set the tone right from the first team reserves right through the academy. And I think, for me, that's what I would like to see Celtic go down that route. Whether or not we would get Ralph Reinick, probably I don't think so, because 
it's going to cost a lot of money for him to come in and do it and set the tone that way to redevelop the whole structure. But I think that's the route for me that Celtic should go down because that's the way the modern game is, um, is going. As we were saying, William, just we kind of said the exact same as you, we, we thought that. Yeah. But there's another big factor in modern football for me that, and Ryan says and we've discussed before is, we feel that if they've took reserve football away, that the youth from under 21s to first team, it's like climbing a mountain mm -hmm. because there's no point against season pros the way you used to in a reserve league. Let's yeah. say back in the day, like if there was a cut of first team players injured, fling them into reserves to get them up match fitness. And these young guys learn that for that, speaking to hard tackles, season pros. And mm -hmm. the only way now young players seem to manage to do that is in the Iron Brew Cup. Yeah. And they only maybe get two or three games at that. But yeah. playing against players at your own age and then ability only lasts so long because you'll go to get into the big bad world sooner or later. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we're saying either the Reserve League or the Colts League merging with League Two and stuff in Scotland. And we reckon that's the way forward for develop young player to develop young players um in Scotland because it's the only way they're they're gonna learn quickly enough to get their chances in first team football. Not just Celtic Rangers, but Aberdeen, Hibs, so on, so on. And I think it would benefit Scottish football as a whole because I reckon, say for instance, Celtic was away to Aberdeen on the Sunday and Celtic Colts was playing Clyde on the Friday night at seven o'clock in their league. They could possibly get three, four thousand fans up at that stadium. And then the young players can play in a big crowd play against season pros at Clyde and then Clyde benefit with, say, the best part of 100 grand. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would agree with that. I, mean, I think the Colts idea is a really good idea. You know, the Spanish do it. The, Spanish, the Barcelona have their B team and Real Madrid have their B team over in Spain and do it. I think you had the nail on the head, Robert. Between under 21 and first, first team is a massive gulf. And I think, like Ryan was touching on after the, the sort of Dubai fiasco, you saw the difference in the level when the young guys came through. They really struggled for the physicality of it and the pace as well. I think they really were off the pace a little bit in terms of the, the intensity of the game. So I think that there's got to either be the reserve league but I think the Colts idea is a really good idea because you're playing against professionals, you know, experienced players and that's the best way these, these young boys learn. You've just got to get them to play games, get them playing against these experienced professionals, test them. You've got to test the players in my opinion to bring the best out of them and to, to sort of develop them further. Is obviously what I was talking to you, obviously how football's changing, eh, Wilgham. How was yeah. obviously now you obviously you've been a wee bit away from it, but how's kind of the the money side or just in general or the football side, how's that changed the agency in general? Um I would say that I would say in terms of the whole agency world, it's become more difficult in terms of there's a lot of people doing it now. So a few years back. The exam I spoke about at the start of the show was, you know, you've done the FIFA regulation exam, passed it. You no longer do that anymore. There is no regulation. You basically just, the FA do a licence that you pay for, um, and you can do that from the football system. But in Scotland, you don't need to pay for it. Anyone, you, Robert, anyone can basically represent another player, as long as, um, I think, once you get to disclosure of Scotland or something like that, they, they sort of do a check on you. So I would say there's, there's more people in the industry now chasing the same amount of players. So it makes it very, very competitive in order to sign those players. Um, and that's happened over the last few years. So I'd say that's probably been the biggest change that's happened. So I think it's, well, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of good you mention that because for me, I think football's changing a lot. And we don't know, obviously, the engine out to the agency world um, because we're, we are quite oblivious to it. Because I think maybe the agents, how do I say it? They don't get maybe a lot of mention to do with things. Yeah. It's more about like with Celtic, it's all about Lobel, it's all about Desmond, it's not about like, maybe my minute, but the agency have done a lot of work to get these guys here. And yeah. obviously now you say because there's a lot more money, it's getting harder to do deals. Yeah. You think as well, it's, are agents still getting a big say in it? Or is, um, the, the, as you say, is the sporting directors and the recruitment, are they dealing with it more? No, I think, um, I think agencies are, or agents in general are, doing a lot of hard work. Look, I think agents get a really, really bad rep. Don't get me wrong, like in any industry, and especially the agent world, there's a few agents that are the bad apples, and they tend to get more of the headlines because it's more of a story. 
but there's a lot of guys, and I know a lot of guys still in the game today who are working really, really hard every day to make things happen and to pro- progress their clients' careers further forward. Now, obviously, fans obviously look at agents as sort of the bad thing of the game as well because, you know, agents will take a player away from their club and take them to another club. But you've got to remember as well, from a club's perspective, a lot of these players are expendable. You know, they're just a, they're just a number almost. It's like a, it's like a value of them. They can sell them to make some money if the club will do it. If they can cut their losses from them to save some money, they'll do it. So we sort of become the mediator in between the player and the, and the club to protect them as much as we can. But I think that, um, yeah, I think agents still get a big name just now. I think you're right, though. I think a lot of discussion happens between the clubs and a lot of the things to do with Celtic tends to be a bit lower this or Desmond that and this, that and the next thing. But there is a lot of hard work that does go on behind the scenes in every transfer deal that I think that a lot of people don't appreciate. See, William, um, Declan McManus just on just last night. Uh, uh-huh. And he spoke about how football's changed in what, seven or eight years of him coming through at football. Mm-hmm. And he dealt with some really good stories about being under Craig Brown and Archie Knox and stuff. And yeah. saying that Craig Brown was like a good cop, Archie Knox was a bad cop and stuff. And he said that you had to be like a tough kid, obviously, coming through at that time. And he says it was good. <laughs> Because they had to carry balls out on the pitch and set up the goals and clean the stand and clean the boots. How did you feel for you back when you started to now? Is it more snowflake mentality nowadays? Like, yeah. are they hard to deal with? Some I would, boys? I, I, I think you're right, Robert. I think when I started in the, in the industry, you would speak to players and good, bad, and indifferent, whatever advice you gave them, they took it on the chin, and a lot of players would react positively from it. Yeah. So, like you said, if somebody like Archie Knox has been a player a hard time, they would go, well, I better get my finger out here and I better get doing what I'm meant to be doing. It's towards the end of when I was working in the game, sort of eight years later, a lot of players would just shrivel up and well, yeah. do you know what I mean? sort of wither and go, I can't do this, or he doesn't like me and he's got something against me. And, and they're just like, look, you just need to roll the socks up and get on with it, you know, and prove them wrong. And I think that, I don't know if that's a generational thing. I know you mentioned the sort of snowflake term that gets banded about, and it is a bit like that. But I did see that big difference in players' mentality. But it could be that, like you said, that Declan was probably talking about having a good ground in Aberdeen, you know, like having to go and clean the stands and do this and do that. I think that has lost a bit, especially what you said about in, in England itself. These players are 16-year-olds and getting paid thousands of pounds a week. and They're not going to be interested in clearing somebody else's boots and like that now, do you know what I mean? And, I think you lose the discipline and the grounding in a player then, um, and obviously when they're coming through. We we spoke about it, me and Ryan, before, and I mentioned that, like, I feel, you feel like you're, like, Sutton spoke about um, coming through, and he done it and stuff like that, and he says that just how it kept him grounded, and yeah. it was like, I'd say when you're a young boy, probably back then, you were in awe, it's some of the players that you were maybe cleaning, say, Gascoigne's books as a young boy. You'd wow, yeah. Gaza's books, and they'd maybe give you a wee tip to clean them right and stuff like that. Whereas now, I would probably think, just in my own opinion, mm. young boys coming through now, I've got a bit of arrogance about them. It's probably, they're no know some of the players that they're going to train with or play mm. with and first team games. I'm not saying them all, but no. they just, it's the social media side of it and everything else. I just feel, I mean, like, Scott Brown is a, in my opinion, is a dying art in a modern game. Mm-hmm. There's you no, know, as leaders and shouting and hard tackles. And I just think the modern game, we a guy like Scott Brown come to end it. There's no going to be another five or six Scott Browns coming through. You'll be lucky if you get one in every 20. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think that is a dying breed in the game. If you remember back even when it was Roy Keane and Patrick Vieira, remember those guys that were playing, you know? Yeah. Those guys would fight for everything. You know, they even fight in the tunnel before the game even started, you know? I remember, we used to love watching that. And all these guys that were really hard on the part, there was loads of them at that time. And, and you're right, I think Scott Brown is a dying breed. I think he'll be a big miss um, even for the Celtic fans, having him on the park and doing that. And doing that. and he was great at doing that, winding up opponents, you know? I think he wound up Aberdeen probably more than anyone else. And now he's going to go, he's going up there and play with them. But, um, yeah, I've not seen many players like that coming through of late, which is a bit disappointing, but disheartening, because that was always a side of the game I loved. I used to love watching players like that. You see, yeah. I've seen them fighting for every scrap, every ball for 90 minutes, and that was the enjoyable part for me um, in watching football. It's like, you're saying, William, I watched the Man City game, and at the end of the game, I 
I think he was Man, U, Man City, and they were cuddling each other on the park. Yeah, yeah, no, it's crazy. So, <laughs> This is meant to be one of the biggest derbies in the world. And yeah, it's not the same, is I've it? Seen, I've seen two lads playing at my back garden. <laughs> determination to win a game of football and no friendly, you know what I mean? Attitude and I just, I feel, that's like seeing we're talking about Celtic giving Rangers a guard of honour there. Yeah. And all these professionals down in England, like, they do the right thing and be a guard of honour. And I'm just thinking... Best bit of our game out the way, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like I know. let them go in the part and express their frustration, hate, fight, whatever yeah. on that part. Don't start guys gathered on and clapping them onto the part. It's a rivalry totally out of football. And exactly. That's the it problem is. in modern football. Yeah, I, I think there wasn't there shouldn't even have been a debate about that for me, about Celtic Rangers. Part of the big draw at Celtic Rangers is the passion and the fierceness that's shown on the park. And to do that before a game, that's like almost like nightmare stuff for both Celtic yeah. and Rangers fans, isn't it? Seeing that actually happen. So, yeah, I think the English game is completely different from that perspective. Um, I know they talk about sportsmanship and everything else, but you want to see rivalry on the park. Like Even, even going back to games when it used to be Arsenal Man United, remember the Wenger oh, yeah. in years and... I remember the one with Van Nistelrooy missed the penalty, you know, half the Arsenal team were basically bullying him, aye, jumping all over him and stuff like that during the game, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that has been lost a bit in the game, especially in England, I think, as well. But I don't think we'll lose that up here, hopefully. Hopefully when the fans, I think, get into the grounds again, you'll see that fierceness and that atmosphere again. Because um, I think that's definitely missing, especially from the Celtic Rangers yeah. game just now. I think the, the fans... Being in the ground, adding to that atmosphere is definitely missing at the minute. So, anyway, fingers crossed next season we've got that back again. There's obviously as well, back to the conference you work there, uh, William. I'm kind of interested in, yep. like, see, like, obviously foreign transfers, guy coming. The two is kind of sticking my mind on that. I, I, I don't know if you knew anything about it, but see, like, what permits and international players? See, like, uh, Celtic signed mm-hmm. Manny Perez and uh, Goodman, and they didn't have work permits mm-hmm. and all that. Yep. And, they came, they trained, and then went back out again to try and get the permits to take more game time and whatever else. Does does that or does that take time? And do you think again? I don't know if it's, if you if you might speak about it, but do you think that was a bit of negligence for Celtic doing that, signing somebody who might have no actually um, been able to play with Celtic? Yeah, I think um, what permits are a really tricky one. What permits are going to change again, probably because of the UK leaving the European Union, which is going to be even more complex. I actually think, looking at the way things are going, I think you might you might actually see a lot of deals happening within the UK more than deals happening UK to Europe and the rest of the world. Because I think because we've left the EU now, you know, guys from France, Spain, Portugal, and whatever are going to need work permits in this in, in this country now. So that's a complication to it. But going back when I was working there, yeah, it tended to be non-EU countries. Um, you had to play a percentage of games for the national team. And had to be competitive games to guarantee a work permit. Now, you could always appeal it depending on the player's potential. You know, So if you were signing a, an up-and-coming superstar from Brazil, you tend to get that one push through. But the, the American one was really, really strange for me because I think that no one really saw that one coming. And then the fact they couldn't get work permits was even more strange because you do your sort of due diligence and say, right, they might not get a work permit, but we could maybe take them to, I don't know, a team in Belgium and let them stay in Belgium, get a Belgian passport. There's ways round about it, but we tend to send them back to America, which was the strange thing for me. So those were a couple of strange deals for me. Work permits tend to take, to be honest, it depends on the, the transfer deal. They can tend to get them done quick, but as long as you fit the criteria, Ryan, it's normally straightforward. But if you don't fit the criteria, it just becomes more complex. So it's something I've always been looking at. Kind of interesting is how the work permits like, exactly what is in what's involved in having to play. Is that something have you been involved in anything like that before with work permits? No, I've never, I've, I've, unfortunately, no. Um, it, it would tend to be handled by the club. So, t- what tends to happen is a, a copy of the player's passport would be sent to, if it was a team in England, they'd be sent to the FA along with the representation contract, the transfer form. Um, and then if it, was a, if it was a foreign player coming in, they would request a transfer certificate to come from that other country in, and then that would basically do the deal. But they would tend to speak to the Home Office in terms of getting the work permits and all that sorted. But if you do, as I said, you do your due diligence, you would tend to have all that prepped and ready by the time the player's coming to sign. Um, 
But obviously, sometimes it might fall through. There might be a technicality that says we're not getting a work permit, but you can go and appeal and try and get it. If not, the deal's off. But yeah, the, the American boys that came in was just a little bit strange. I don't quite know where they came from and how that was actually structured, but it was just the fact that I know like Chelsea would sign players from Africa and other places, and then they would ship them out to like a Belgian side or like a Norwegian side. And you know, guys like Wanyama and that came from Scandinavia because they tended to go on a different passport, and that's how they would come to the UK and play. But it was just kind of the fact we sent them back to America again. So it was a strange one. It was a strange one for me, that one. I think they were just going to that stuff. I think these boys must have had potential come out of college and probably Celtic for get them on free transfers, send them back where they do well, we can make a bit of money on them. I don't know. But I thought it was rather strange myself because... Goodman didn't even play now he's away to somebody else in there. Aye, it's weird. And, and they weren't even playing in MLS. It was like the USL 2 or something like that, wasn't it? It was like a couple of leagues below. And like you said, it could have just been a sort of punt that they went, let's bring these two boys over. They look decent on the training pitch. Ship them back and try and make a few quid out of it. It definitely could have been that. Yeah. And obviously, oh. as well, as you say, as well, you're a Celtic fan. Um, yeah. Can I. Obviously, this season, as you say, is before we come on, it's not been the best of seasons. Obviously, we don't we don't know what's been happening, but what's your kind of feelings on obviously at the moment and obviously the future? Yeah. Is there any preference for the manager you like to come in? Obviously, we spoke about before we come on, what way the how Bournemouth, so you know exactly how Eddie how it works, and you yeah. say obviously it could be a perfect fit, but again, Celtic, as we mean, what can kind I of say is like. Some fans are saying you can't get Eddie Howe, you can't get Jesse March, you can't get Ralph Randick, and I'm saying, well, you need to ask the question first. All you can do is ask these guys a question. Yeah, I, I think um, if I was to get anyone, it would be Ralph Ragnick to come in as sporting director, and it would be Jesse March to be under him. Now, a lot of people probably say I'm in dreamland there. I know that Ralph Ragnick is not working just now and not back Schalke of late. Um, the, the only problem is Jesse March is probably highly touted to go to the Bundesliga this year. Um, I know myself. I tend to follow German football quite a bit actually and there's a lot of changes going to happen at the top level there. It looks like Hansi Flick, the manager of Bayern Munich, is going to go to Germany so it's going to leave the Bayern door open and I think Nagelsmann is going to go there from Leipzig so it might open the door for Jesse Marks to go back to Leipzig as manager. So I don't think we'll get him. He would probably be my first choice and plus the fact he spoke really highly of the club. It was really nice to hear what he said about the club and being linked to the club and being honoured um, to be linked to it. But yeah, I think if it's not him it would probably be Eddie Howe for me. I think what Eddie achieved at Bournemouth, um, I know a lot of fans will come on here and say he's not won anything, but he took that club from rock bottom almost, took them into Premier League, and they sustained the Premier League status over a, a few seasons, um, and obviously he moved on. But what I know about Eddie is he will develop players. Um, he will sit down with every player, video analysis, coaching one to one. He spends so much time with the players to make them better. And I think that's what we need at the club just now. But not only that, I think the way he plays football, possession-based football, fluid, um, very fluid football in terms of intensity, winning the ball back, pressing, that's the sort of football I want to see again. Similar to what Brendan Rodgers had at Celtic. Um, it was enjoyable to watch. We all enjoyed watching his play and keeping the ball and keeping possession and scoring a lot of goals. So I think Eddie would bring that. Um, so, yeah, that would probably be my, my option if it wasn't going to be Jesse March. But... Um, Obviously, there's a lot of talk about Roy Keane just now. Um, but as you said, no one knows who it's going to be. It's only really the Celtic board know who it's going to be. So I suppose time will tell. Time will tell whoever it's going to be. Thank you. As I've said to, to long before we came on, that Eddie Howe has been the guy I've been saying for months. And we had done a podcast on him, Morgan, uh, knowing him, but just we spoke about the different managers who, why they maybe suit Celtic, what we bring to Celtic. We mentioned their names, uh, March. Ranjek, um, yeah. Eddie Howe, and it, Robert was kind of talking about kind of Michael O'Neill because when you rob it, because he was used to working with a budget, he'd done well with Ireland, and that's obviously been the money, that's just getting players together, getting, mm -hmm. getting a lot of camaraderie, an atmosphere, getting guys to work as like a club kind of feel. And Robert, when you rob it, Bob, kind of Rob, maybe putting Michael O'Neill in a hat. I am, um, what I say is, is um, William is. I would love the glamorous name of Eddie Howe, Rafael Benitez or Martinez. And, but I thought we Celtic as a club is we're not going to get a glamorous name. So what I, my thinking behind it was is Michael O'Neill was because 
his coaching ability, he went with Shamrock Rovers. Um, he finished mm. second in the league the first season. Second season, he won the double. He got them into Europa League the first time they'd ever qualified in Europe for a group stage. he done all right in the group. Um, he won the league again, had a fight with him, took a Northern Ireland job, took him for absolute rock bottom, yeah. took him to the European Championship, um, was on the verge of qualifying for the World, World Cup. Was it World Cup they were in? Or the two European Championship? Euros, the Euros, wasn't it? Euros, Euros. Euros. Qualified for the World Cup, left them in a good position. Mm-hmm. Took over at Stoke and took them for the bottom of the league and they finished tenth last season before COVID hit. Yeah. And his buyout clause is eight hundred grand. And I just feel he's always worked on a budget. He knows how to organise a team. He seems to get the best out of average players. I'm not saying Celtic players are average, but he just seemed to be in the mould that Celtic would take on. You know yeah. what I mean? That's my thinking behind it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if Michael Neil if that's somebody but then maybe do it for yourself, Bob. Well, I don't know if you've ever dealt with Michael O'Neill personally. No, 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 I haven't had any deals with I do know, um, or I did hear, don't know whether it's true or not, but before Brendan Rogers got the job at Celtic, Celtic were talking to Michael O'Neill at that time. And I, I think he was definitely on the list because of, the, like Robert had just explained, you know, he'd done a great job, Shannon Rose, and then he completely revitalised Northern Irish football, you know, taking them. And, and I know myself that he completely changed how the players approached the games there you know I think the players used to turn up to the training and just train he took them to a hotel and had them down doing team meetings and all that stuff he changed the entire structure and again that's that's maybe a forward thinking guy that Celtic could do with you know you know, come in and change the structure and how we approach things um, because I think it's going to take that now because we've not really had I don't think we've had that this year at all there's not really been a structure to definitely not on the park there's been no shape on the park this year at all mm-hmm. I think tactical know-how and how to approach games because this year's just looked as if it's almost been a bit rudderless to me the way we've been playing and you can just see we're pulled all over the place in terms of shape but even behind the scenes as well as, we, as you said you know everyone knows we've been looking for like a, a centre half or a left back or whatever so long and why does it take so so long to happen is it a clash of personalities or whatever but we need everyone working on the and going in the same direction working together same direction um, Mike O'Neill could be the guy that can bring that. I don't think it would be a bad appointment, to be honest. Um, he's not the glamour name, as Robert said, but it could be the one that's probably more realistic. Um, and obviously, um, the future, William, um, obviously you say you're out of the uh, agency at the moment. Um, yep. Any plans? Obviously, you say you've got a lot of contacts, but do you think maybe in the future you go back into it? Because obviously, you probably couldn't miss a lifestyle of uh, scouting, travelling, but as you say, you're a busy man, so maybe it's been a way if it can give you a bit of relaxation to go back into it. Yeah. Is a future hole for you? I don't know, to be honest, what's around the corner. Um, I do think I probably will maybe go back to it at some point. I really enjoyed, overall, I really enjoyed the time I spent in the, the sort of football football world. Um, and it's always good to talk about it again because you sort of remember a lot of things that actually happened over that period of time. So it was good to obviously speak to you about it tonight and give you hopefully give you a bit of an insight of how everything works within the game. But, um, but yeah, who knows? We'll just need to take it as it comes, Ryan. And uh, I think first and foremost, I'd love to go on holiday right now. So I think that's my priority first for everybody as well. So um, yeah, who knows? I might be back to it. And then, listen, who knows? I may be back speaking to you again when I do. So that'll be good. As I say, it's, can I, it's been brilliant for me because I love finding about people's stories and uh-huh. especially the agency world because not a lot of people get to know what you've just told us. So for me, Robert, it's a privilege for me because it's... Especially doing all this, we're taking different people on and learning about different kind of experiences people have had and listening to your experiences through agency and even some of the guys you've worked with and some of the clubs I've dealt with. For me, Robert, it's been brilliant for you to get them on, mate, because it's it's been really, I've enjoyed just sitting here listening, just listening because it's been good. It's really good, Brian. This is where you've got to broaden your horizons. About, it's not just about the 90 minutes of football, it's about everything that goes on behind the scenes how to get a deal done. William's opened a lot of our ears and probably a lot of listeners' ears to what potentially happens on deals and how you go, how did that not just happen? How does this not happen? Now, hopefully a lot of people can understand slightly a bit more on that side of how footballs run. Agents, teams, players, meeting CEOs, meeting managers. It's just, there's a lot of what has to go on behind the scenes and, Williams gave us a wee bit of insight into how that actually works and 
how deals can just get scuppered at last minutes through a certain manager or a certain director of football or whatever. So it's a great insight and I really appreciate William coming on tonight. I think it's been really, really good. No, as I say, I just want to echo what uh, Robert says. Well, I appreciate you coming on, mate. It's been brilliant to have your time. No, no problem at all, guys. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure um, and I'm enjoying what you guys are doing just now as well. So keep it up and listen, feel free to invite me back anytime at all. It'll be a real pleasure to do it again. No, honestly, I definitely, I'll take you up on that, mate, because I'm just, I'm not all of you, but I'm not all right to listen to your stories because it's, it's brilliant to hear, as Robert says, not just about the football, but different aspects in football and how, how, as Robert says, how deals are done and how you deal with players and, and other agents. And again, it's just been brilliant to have you on, William. Um, Robert, once again, mate, brilliant to have you on. And William, again, mate, thanks a lot. Take care. Keep well. And hopefully we can get a few beers and a, a bit of sunshine soon, mate. Take care. Look forward to it. Thanks, mate.